So this is the third um, of the short recordings for this lecture on infrared and Raman. Um, I've been talking about this notch filter um, and I just wanted to show you kind of what I mean by filters in general and, um, and how we can use them um, in order to just selectively select the signal that I want to see. Um, but there are two ways that I can basically select the signal that I want to do. One is going to be wavelength dependent, the other is going to be time dependent. Um, if I think about a wavelength dependent thing, I'm going to start at the bottom, kind of describing what goes on with filters here. But a long pass filter will selectively let wavelengths that are longer than a certain point through. And a short pass filter selectively lets wavelengths that are shorter. Um, this is basically the principle of how the fluorometers in the FISCAM teaching lab work. They have a, 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 a short pass filter in, a long pass filter out. I could also have band pass, which will let a selective, selective wavelengths through. So it might let all wavelengths from 500 to 600 nanometers through. Um, so my transmission is, um, is essentially zero, except at the sele selection of wavelengths that I want to, um, I want to see. Finally, my notch filter, this will let all wavelengths through, except a specific kind of set, a small set of wavelengths. So you can see my transmission is essentially 100% the whole way across, except for where I want to eliminate light coming through. Um, this is called my notch. I can make this um, excluded band be really quite small in the re region of, you know, uh, fractions of nanometers. So I can selectively get rid of my Rayleigh scattered light, but still preserve all of the information from my Raman. This means that I'm not saturating my detector with my Rayleigh scattered light, allowing me to see the very, very low signals that come from Raman. I've said that Raman is one photon in a million. So we need to, um, we need to do everything we can to make sure that I'm not kind of messing with my measurement or saturating it with just my Rayleigh scattered. So this notch filter will selectively exclude my excitation wavelength. They're very, very clever things. And filters in general are used to make very crude spectrometers. Um, but it's kind of a really good first pass principle. And a lot of the fluorescence perhaps that we want to measure is just does it fluoresce rather than looking at the spectrum or looking at how it evolves with time? You know, a, a crude first measurement is, does it fluoresce? Um, as I've said already, we see the Raman um, better as I use um, low wavelength, high, in, high frequency light. Um, so it's better for me to use higher frequencies, but again, I don't want you to kind of fall into the trap of forgetting that other things can go on. So if I'm looking at, um, at say, DNA, DNA absorbs at 260 nanometers. If I start to have um, energy, ex kind of a laser in higher in this energy, I'm certainly giving plenty of energy to react, never mind just absorb a photon. So we have to think carefully about these things, that whilst the pay off you know for going green over red it, we have to think about the other consequences of what else I might be exciting in my system or you know what's the chemistry associated with an excitation the bottom of this I've mentioned time gating techniques and that's what this next slide is about you can see I've kind of got a crude um, spectra of what's going on if I kind of allow my uh, signal collection to be very long what I'm going to see is I'm going to see the pulse I'm going to see uh, my Raman and I'm going to see my fluorescence so here my red line is representing my fluorescence this blue line is representing the kind of the pulse energy and the green line is representing the Raman this is on the, the top set and so overall I see this kind of purple combination if I try and just selectively time gate out anything after that fluorescence starts to grow in, then I'm only looking at my, essentially, my uh, Raman signal. So on this bottom image, you can see that I've got this kind of asymmetric kind of pulse shape, and it's because I've selected just that kind of Gaussian profile before I start to see this fluorescence signal growing in. We've seen the same fluorescence profile before, 
um, I said that this, um, this information we can get from the fluorescence from the time growing and from the decay is very, very useful. But if I don't want to look at fluorescence, it's no use at all. So selectively being able to just pull out the Raman from before that fluorescence occurs is really, really useful as well. This uses something called a Kurgate. Uh, I believe it's mentioned in the paper that I've recommended to you today. Um, Kurgate's work on the principles of biorefringence. So again, everything kind of comes around, everything comes together. Um, one other way I can improve the signal, or one way I can get better Raman out, is by using this technique called resonance. So in that previous figure before, I, I mentioned Rayleigh and I mentioned um, Raman and I mentioned anti-Stokes Raman. Um, but I also pointed out the fact that we could have this resonance Raman if I had um, an excitation wavelength which overlapped with the absorption of my molecule. Um, I'm not going to go into the physics of why this has such a great effect, just to say that it really does have a massive effect on the Raman signal. My Raman signal is increased somewhere between 100 and 10,000 or even a million times uh, more um, just from hitting a resonance. So from going a maximum of one in, um, one in a million photons before, I can start to see really quite strong Raman signals. The consequences of this is I can use a much less concentrated uh, solution, so somewhere down in the nanomolar regime rather than um, very, very high 0.1 molar samples before. It's not always possible to get my sample to be in the 0.1 molar regime. Uh, so this has to be something to consider as well. And if we're working with um, perhaps, as I've already mentioned, cancer cells you know, in, in, in urine, they are very, very low um, concentration things and the thing that we're looking for within the cancer cell is very very low concentration indeed so being able to um, make the most get the most signal out of my Raman as I can uh, is really important so this is going to be something which has as I say an absorption at this um, wavelength that I'm going to use my um, laser light in for my Raman the problem with having exciting onto an absorption is I see more fluorescence. And so it starts to be the two compete together. And so, as I say, this is why we need to be able to kind of get rid of the fluorescence out of my signal. Um, but looking at resonance Raman, this allows me to um, target specific species in solution. If I'm only looking at where something absorbs or I'm getting a, a much bigger signal where something absorbs, it means if I've got multiple things in solution and I only am targeting the absorption of one of them, I'm going to see much, much more Raman out of that one than in a, of, of anything else. So this could be used in biological applications, as I've already mentioned with that, um, that paper um, on whiskey. But if you look at other papers by that group, they're targeting cancer cells. It means that I can target specific chromophores in proteins, or I can look at um, chromophores bound to DNA. The natural extension of this is time-resolved studies. Um, if I take previously, you know, I have taken my absorption, I've I've turned it into transient absorption, or I've taken my fluorescence and I've looked at how the lifetime decays. Um, we can do exactly the same thing with Raman, or, or indeed infrared, although I haven't mentioned it so much here. Um, I've already covered the basic principles of time resolution in spectroscopy. It doesn't change. It's a different, um, it's a different type of spectroscopy, but the same principles of time resolution apply. So really quite kind of simple, bringing these concepts together. I said that everything would come together, and, and it does. Um, so back to this kind of structure of the spectrometer, um, <coughs> excuse me, the Raman and the fluorescent spectrometer look the same, They're basically the same building blocks together, just looking at two slightly different things. Um, the issue is that I can see possible interference between my um, 
my fluorescence and my ramen signal. And quite often if you've got very low fluorescence, particularly if you end up with a water ramen, you can start to see bumps and peaks on your spectra, which are quite annoying. Um, so we have to kind of consider this. We select appropriate wavelengths or we mathematically remove Raman signal from fluorescence. But what happens if I want to be looking at the fluorescence, or sorry, I want to be looking at the Raman rather than the fluorescence? So here I've got a typical luminescence peak. You can see exactly the wavelength I'm exciting at because that's my Rayleigh peak. Before it, I don't really see any fluorescence at all because there is no energy there to do it. And I'm assuming that there's a reasonably big Stokes shift here and that I see my separate emission peak. Um, and so here, sorry, I've got, um, sorry, I've got two slightly different things. Sorry, my fault. Um, as I say, Raman signals often appear in the emission spectra, particularly if I'm looking at water Raman coming out of my things. Um, but I can lose my Raman in my fluorescence as well. Um, this is what I was trying to show here. The Here I have my Rayleigh peak in one place. I excite at a slightly different wavelength and my signal drops slightly because um, the absorption is going to be different. But you can see my Rayleigh peak moving between the two. Um, sorry. The same applies to any Raman peak. I change my excitation wavelength and my Raman peak is going to move. Um, because I'm looking at a distance, a scattered distance between them. Um, the change in vibrational energy level is the same, but I put in different wavelengths of incident light and I'm going to see different wavelengths of accident light. Um, this means that I can just use this basic principle of the two kind of, spe sorry, two spectra here having different sizes for my different um, in, in this incidence wavelengths of light um, and I can start to be able to remove my kind of deconvolute my signal of one from the other. Um, changing the incident wavelength however is a crude method of doing this because I've, as I've said the Raman signal varies with wavelength um, it affects the signal intensities from the absorption anyway. Um, it's not a great method of doing it. And this time gating is much, much <clears throat> more effective. I already mentioned how to do it. Um, Raman signals come out instantly. It's a scattered process. There's no kind of sitting in an excited state, whereas fluorescence there is. So if I could have something that basically shutters out the fluorescence, that would be a really important thing. Um, so I've listed this paper here um, from the American Journal of Physics, uh, which basically shows the effect of a Kerr gate. Um, the way a Kerr gate is working is that I see a change in refractive index with an applied electric field. In other words, light goes through, I see a change in refractive index. Um, K, this is just a constant, it depends upon the material I'm using, and my electric field can be applied as either um, direct current or alternating current. Um, what's happening here is my material is becoming birefringent. Upon the application of this electric field, my material is birefringent. And so I have the same birefringence properties that I used when I was looking at... Um, when I was looking at um, LD and CD, kind of using, again, these same principles, everything comes around again. So if you remember from um, what we had um, with our birefringence, we had this kind of um, equation that linked the 
essentially the um, the distance that the thing had to pass through and I would see that there would be changes in the properties of the light depending on how far it, it had to pass through the material which is this L term. Uh, it also depends on this Kerr constant that we, we see as well and the applied potential um, to the thing. So if I step up now my um, image, my kind of schematic of my um, Raman spectrometer, we can see we can put this Kerr gate in there. Now, as I say, you're best to read this um, this paper. So it's a fantastic paper in, in applied spectroscopy, uh, which has come out of the Rutherford lab. Um, give that a quick read through if you're an MCHEM. If you're a BSc student, don't worry about it too much. But if you're an MCHEM, give that one a read through. Um, and learn about how Kerr gating is, wor is working. And in all kind of modern Raman experiments um, that are time resolved, this Kerr gate is used to help eliminate the um, effect of fluorescence from the sample. Now, I had intended to um, have a bit of a discussion here. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about in part with the, um, the MCHEM. So that is this paper on, uh, on Kerr gating. Um, yeah, I'd hoped that you know we'd finish this up, and I was expecting this to kind of just take fifteen minutes at the beginning of a lecture. Um, and so, I was going to talk about this um, curgating paper, <coughs> which we will talk about after Christmas. This is one of the papers that I've I've referenced you to. Um, it will be appear. It's this applied spectroscopy paper. Uh, as I say, far, far more important for the MCHEMs to understand this paper. There's some kind of basic, really good, important things in this paper. Um, I've spoken about the effect of resonance, Rama, and I've spoken about the effect of Kerr gating and time resolved. But there's another way that I can improve the signal, and that's using something that we call surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Um, this is using basically we absorb it our, our analyte down onto either gold or silver. Uh, silver's particularly good for this and not too expensive. There's still some uncertainty exactly how surface enhanced Raman works, but essentially we know that it works better if it's a highly curved surface. So instead of putting it down on a sheet of gold, I tend to absorb it onto gold colloid or silver colloid. Um, and people have found that instead of making spherical colloids, if you can make shaped colloids, it has an even greater enhancement. So there's, you get these little silver stars, which seem to be really amazing at, um, at enhancing the signal. It's to do with the electric field, probably, around the surface, but other people have other ideas. Um, surface enhancement is a great thing if we can't get a resonance. Uh, it increases the Raman signal again significantly, at least a thousand times more signal than we previously saw. Um, it only works if we can get the analyte to go down onto the surface, but luckily gold will stick to most things, particularly most things with the thiol in there. Um, so we, when we have a colloid, we can easily usually get everything down onto the surface. And I've used surface enhanced Raman on quite crude instruments to just be able to see more signal. It doesn't need to be a very fancy setup. <coughs> so here I um, here, sorry, I have basically a, a, a schematic of my nanoparticles, and we can actually see in this paper here in nanotechnology uh, that people have been able to kind of look at. Um, at how the Raman signal is changing um, based upon the size and the shape and things like that with the particles. Um, we can help get the signal, the things down onto a surface if we look at uh, electrochemical definition. If I look at very rough surfaces, so I basically look at a colloid deposited onto something, I still get all the effect of the colloid rather than looking in solution. Um, but it means that I can start to apply kind of electrochemical techniques to get stuff to go down on there. Um, I can also 
basically use the same principle as the fact that I've got something very, very pointy, very, very sharp, to be very, very clever and look at something called TERS. So TERS is basically looking at uh, an AFM, which is basically an AFM is looking at basically if you basically run your finger along something and see how the texture changes. Now imagine doing that on a molecular level with a gold tip running across a surface. Um, that's basically how AFM is working, but all of a sudden I've introduced a gold tip. It's highly curved. Uh, it's having all the benefits that I want from, um, from a surface enhanced technique. And we call this tip enhanced. And we can look, this kind of bottom image here is coming from a, a TERS um, approach. So we can get very, very clever with Raman. It's incredibly versatile. It's perhaps the most versatile spectroscopy I've ever come across. Um, because you just tweak it and you keep on tweaking it. And, and I, I can think of, you know, multiple, I can probably think of more Raman versions of spectroscopy than I can of any other spectroscopy put together. Um, I'm trying to introduce you to these things. So that if you come across them, you basically, you understand that it's just Raman. It's just, you know, a fancy act. A fancy adult. I'm not expecting you to be experts in how all of these things work. In fact, I don't think you could be experts, even if this whole course was just about ramen. There are just too many variations on a theme. The great thing, though, about surface enhanced ramen is it improves my signal without needing to hit a resonance. That means that if you know I'm looking at, at DNA or something where my resonance is way up at 260 and I can have all this extra chemistry coming off it. Um, I I, I'm not seeing an increase in fluorescence. The other thing, though, with SIRS is that it quenches fluorescence. By absorbing my molecule down onto my surface, I see less fluorescence in the first place, which is a really useful side effect. People don't really, as I say, understand how it works. And a lot of the papers that come out about SIRS in physics journals are trying to work out how it works. There's a couple of ideas. It could be a plasmon. So this is kind of looking at the a bulk property of the um, of the colloid. Or it could be an effect of charge transfer between my analyte and my colloid surface. Um, as I say, I'm just trying to introduce you to techniques rather than to um, actually get you to fully understand them, just so that you're aware that they exist. Um, as I say, Brahman's incredibly versatile. And another useful technique of Raman is looking at spatially offset Raman. So we've already kind of mentioned this reflectance IR where we could look within a surface. And this is the Raman equivalent of it um, in terms of we are looking below a surface. So RIR um, uses a broad illumination and you know, it's essentially my UV vis, but looking at, at uh, light coming out after it's been absorbed into my surface. If instead I look at surface offset Raman, I have um, light going physically into my sample a certain distance, and I look at the Raman scatter from below the surface. Now this has been uh, suggested that it could be looking at drug molecules within their packaging to make sure that they haven't been tampered with or to make sure they're not fakes. Um, but it's also being used, you know, people are looking at below artworks to see, you know, what is potentially painted underneath something like the Mona Lisa or something. So being able to look deep within a sample is a really, really useful technique. And we're, by doing, you know, being able to look underneath a painting, we can start to see the pigments that were there. So we know what colours and we can rebuild paintings this way. So uh, this is kind of taking... Raman, our classic kind of chemistry or physics kind of spectroscopy, but taking it out into a world that, you know, perhaps is completely unexpected. And there's actually some research by Andy Beebe, who's at Durham, who's been looking at, um, at very, very old manuscripts. So we're talking uh, things like the Lindisfarne Bible. Um, so three, 1,300, 1,400 year old books. Um, and he's been looking at, at the pages and also looking at, you know, ink that has perhaps been um, removed or overpainted from these um, from these very, very old books. So, as I say, really, really useful. Um, 
as I said, Raman is an incredibly versatile technique. I've just listed a few of the different versions of Raman that are out there. Um, you know, I, I can think of more off the top of my head as we speak right now. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that with Raman, you're only limited by your imagination. You can start to tell incredible things about molecules and about structures and about, you know, big things, even the size of books. I hope you've enjoyed this course. As I say, after Easter, we will be talking about some of the papers and discussing them.